again to Colossians chapter 3. To look at verses 16 and 17 today. The word says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. <coughs> Have you ever considered or thought about where we get the elements of our worship services and our church activities? We have to begin back with the Jewish traditions, or surely Christianity was in its beginning, in its inception, it was a sect of Judaism. Now having made a complete split, we still reach out our hands to our friends, who are physical descendants of Abraham, but who need to become part of the new Jerusalem. But inherent in the ideas, or in the Jewish tradition, were both of these ideas, the Word and the Psalm. God had given the priests as a special class. You remember when the, when the law came, when they were freed from slavery in Egypt. God established Aaron, Moses' brother, as the high priest. And Aaron's descendants after him were given as the priestly class. But Aaron and Moses were from the tribe of Levi. And the Levites were a special designation as well. They were given as religious members of the clergy, although not in the sacraments. They were singers in the church, <coughs> musicians in the church, uh, in the temple or tabernacle church of that day. They were um, uh, to help the priests accomplish their, their duties. They were the one tribe that was not given a, a section of land in the inheritance, but rather were given cities within each of the inheritance. And they were there <coughs> to teach the people when they were away from the tabernacle and the temple to teach them appointed as special servants in the rituals and ceremonies. We can see both of these traditions, <coughs> both the, the priest and the Levite, in, uh, in, thank you. <coughs> I don't know where that scratch came from. Uh, in the rebuilding of the walls under the leadership of Nehemiah, after the walls had been finished, Ezra the priest stood before the people and read to them the words of the law. Some of the Levites also taught the law and made it easy for the people to understand what it meant. But later, at the dedication ceremony for the walls, <coughs> Nehemiah had brought in the Levites from all over the countryside, and they became what could best be described as a marching band. You might call it a, a choir that was processing into the temple area, but they didn't just, you know, they did it high, high style. They marched on top of the rebuilt walls. That's how we know that the walls were substantial, that they were sturdy, that they were tall enough, probably two or three or four, maybe even six side by side, marching on the walls and then into the temple area. They proceeded in two groups, one coming from each direction. Can't you imagine it now around the, the walls of the temple, of uh, the walls of Jerusalem? Here come the choirs and the singers and the drummers and the harpists marching in, singing and shouting and playing the God. 
taking their places eventually in the house of the Lord. Now by the time Jesus came around, the, the synagogue had taken over much of the affairs of the people, the daily affairs, the weekly affairs of the people. They still made pilgrimages to Jerusalem on a regular basis, as was appointed by the law. They would go to the Passover. They would go annually to, uh, to offer the sacrifice, to be there during the times when it was uh, the big festivals, religious festivals. But most of the religious life took place in the villages and towns, in the synagogues, scattered throughout. <coughs> this tradition had come down from the time of captivity. While they were in Babylon, captive there, they could not come to the temple. The temple did not exist. Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilt the temple and the walls around Jerusalem as they were coming out of captivity. But while they were away from the Holy Land, while they were away and the temple was not there, they continued to teach the law, to learn the law. When the Jews had been away from the temple, they studied the word of the God together. We frequently see Jesus participating in the synagogue services in his hometown in Nazareth, in Capernaum, in all of the towns of Galilee in the northern part of the country. In fact, it was one of these services where he opened the book of Isaiah and read what we might call his manifesto, his calling, his mission statement. The word of God is upon me. The Spirit of God is upon me and has anointed me to preach release to the captives. The day of Jubilee, the year of God's favor. Indeed, even when he was on trial before the Sanhedrin, Jesus said to them, I have always openly taught in the synagogues and in the temple." Where the Jews always meet. I have said nothing in secret. For which of those words do you now prosecute? The Jewish tradition was there. Paul writes and says that we should allow the word to dwell richly in us. The idea is that the word greatly influences both our attitudes and our actions. It's not simply that we should it should be proclaimed together. Now there is a place for the public <coughs> reading of the word, but it is also to dwell in us rich. It's not really just one person teaching the word. It's, it's more a small group. Our Sunday school classes, our Wednesday services. It's a group of people sitting around and allowing the Word of God to engage one another. In those tradition, Paul says in one place that uh, if one is speaking, another one has an inspiration. The first one should be quiet. We interrupt each other frequently in Bible studies. Don't we? Which is okay if God prompts us to speak into that. Each of us has the responsibility to allow the instructions from the Word of Christ to deeply affect and influence how we exchange and interchange both our internal attitudes and our external, our ex external actions especially in the church, how we interact with one another, the Word should be our guide. I think Paul may have been taking another uh, crack as well at those who felt like they had some special knowledge. You know, they, they held back that knowledge that they had. They said, this is special, and only certain ones of you could get this knowledge. Or maybe only those of you who would be willing to, to pay for the classes could get the special knowledge. I think Paul is saying as well, no, no, no. Don't hold the word back. If the word is there, let it dwell in you, among you, richly. 
Give the Word. Share the Word. We're to teach and admonish, he says, with all wisdom. In the synagogue, in the early church, it did not refer to one person standing in front of the others. It was the small group. But it was also with all wisdom. For even though one may come in and they may think that they have a revelation from God, it may be contrary to sound doctrine. And there may have to be an admonishing that goes along with it. Bringing them back. One person might have been the facilitator, but everyone was encouraged to participate. I think of the, uh, uh, the Quaker who in their services have no leader or guide. There's no pulpit up front. The, the, the pews are, are in a semicircle. And as each one has a movement from God, a song, a verse, a word, they stand and they give it. And when everyone is finished, they dismiss. It's an interesting tradition. Not one everyone could get along with. This was a community Paul was speaking to that was guiding each member into the richness of the indwelling of God. And then, he's, and then Paul brings in the music. He says, not only is the teach one another with all wisdom, but as you sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart. Music was important in the life of God's people, even for the Jews in the ancient world. Psalm 137, as a for instance, gives a wonderful testimony from the captivity. And it talks about how, how the, the captors, those who were with them in the captivity, who, who had heard about all the beautiful music of the Jews, said, won't you sing us one of those beautiful songs? Psalmist writes, how can we sing the songs of God away from the temple, away from His presence? How can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? Many commentators see this implication that the songs, the psalms, the, the 150 songs that are recorded for us in the Old Testament, they were popular before the captivity, many of them written by King David, by Asaph, by other members of the Levitical tribe. They stopped singing in captivity. But when they came back, when Nehemiah brought them back and rebuilt the walls, he brought back the songs of Zion with them. The songs of the Lord rang out again. Now, <clears throat> You have to look a little harder to see. For we never see Jesus, we never have a record of Jesus actually singing. Think for a moment. Can you think of anywhere in the Gospels where Jesus sang a song? It took me a while. I found one. <laughs> I did. Both Matthew and Mark give us a single glimpse into the music of the day. Both references come from the end of the meal in the upper room. We call it the Last Supper. Matthew and Mark both say that following the Last Supper, following the meal, they sang a song and went out to the Mount of Olives. Now if they sang a song and Jesus was with them, he sang along. In the life of the early church there are a few references to singing as well. However, it should be noted that, that uh, Paul and Silas, you remember they were singing. And as they were singing and praising God, about midnight, the scripture 
says. They were in jail, in the Philippian jail. About midnight, an earthquake came and all the doors of the prison were thrown open and the chains on every prisoner were released. Singing. Gratitude. Now if Paul and Silas were singing the songs of the church, they probably had practiced them before. They probably weren't making up the songs as they went along. They were songs that the church sang across the region. Maybe even the songs that Paul taught the new believers when they came in and were baptized and believed. There's no reason to believe that this was a rare occurrence or that it was unique. The disciples sang a song together. It means they all knew it. If Paul and Silas were singing together, it means they were on the same page. They may have been singing in harmony, but they were singing from the same book, the same page. Finally, one of the earliest descriptions of Christian service given to us by a non-Christian. Pliny was the Roman governor of Bithynia, which was the eastern section of what we call Asia Minor. It was right across the Adriatic Sea on the west side. And he wrote to Emperor Trajan. Trajan was the emperor from 98 AD to 117. He wrote to the emperor about the Christian service. He said they meet at dawn to sing a hymn to Christ as God. Every morning, Christians in town would come together before they started their regular daily events. He doesn't say that they would share a story. He doesn't say that they would sit down and have communion. He says every morning, they came and sang a song to Christ as God. He was so impressed by their singing, this is one of the primary elements that he included in his reports. Barclay says that the Christians of the first century were unique, for no other religious festivals included that kind of singing together. There is wisdom to be shared in us, through us, and among us. It should surprise us little then that there is two elements, the Word and the Song, should accompany the new church, the new Israel, the new assembly of believers. There was the sharing of the Word. There would have been the Old Testament prophets, the prophecies about Jesus. There would have been the stories about Jesus which were circulating in oral form which eventually would be written down in Gospels. They would know, do as we have done today. They would have recounted one of His parables. And they would have plumbed its depths. And they would have risen in the heights of joy as they experienced the Word. The goal was not knowledge, simply, but wisdom. Knowledge is understanding the facts, and wisdom is the application of the facts. Knowledge is knowing, wisdom is doing. Wisdom is the goal. Wisdom is taking knowledge into daily life. Wisdom is knowledge applied. Wisdom is the truth appropriated into all that we have, all that we are, all that we their gatherings were not complete, however, unless they sang a song. Some measure of praise expressed in melodic and rhythmic cadence. A song. A song that someone wrote. A song that they had heard when they traveled. A song that they had sung the last 10 or 20 or 50, maybe 100. They didn't sing for 150 years, but we still sing songs today that are 150 years old. It should be the same today. 
we should teach and admonish one another in the Word with real life application, with knowledge and experience. We should sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in our hearts to God. I suppose that the only part of our regular activities which is not mentioned here is the breaking of bread. And it doesn't matter what church you're a part of. Every church says, boy, we like to eat. And how we do. Paul addresses this in other letters. But as much as we like to talk and meet together and sing, it's okay for us to eat together as well. It has always been part of the tradition of the church to share the word and song and a meal to remember in communion the covenant of the Lord. Perhaps then today's message really is an invitation to a deeper walk. It's quite important and yet quite personal. Have you allowed the activities of the church, the word, and song to dwell in you rich. Do they change and transform your attitudes on the inside and your actions on the outside? Your interactions with others, are they transformed because the word dwells in you? Because there's a song in your heart as you go through the day? Are you a participant in the Word or simply an observer of all that goes on? My prayer is that each of us would grow and prosper, allowing to Christ to dwell in us and among us rich. Wonderfully, when the Word takes root in our heart and begins to grow inside of us, then everything else is transformed. And then verse 17 comes in. The capstone, if you will. Whatever you do, in word or in deed. You see, if the Word of Christ dwells in you richly, then it really is not a command, but it's just a statement of fact. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, we are His. He is our motivation. He is our source. He is the one for whom we live. Thank you.